Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to joining us for this month's tax investigation webinar. Myself, Dave Jennings, ex HMRC, the judge has experience on both sides of the fence, and Dane Skiba, also ex HMRC, a bit, uh, a bit younger than, the, than, than me. And we're, we're presenting again our, our monthly um, catch up with uh, what's going on in the world of investigations. This month, we've decided to give an update on some recent tax cases, first tier and upper tier tribunal. So we will give you some information about those cases which are of interest in the work that we do and the work that you might also be doing. Or um, if you have uh, friends, relatives, anybody involved in, in similar sort of issues, then do, do take uh, professional advice. So without uh, further ado, let's um, open these slides up. Quick intro, Churchill Tax, we are a full service firm. We provide accounting um, and, and tax services, some specialist tax services around some tax planning, particularly private properties, um, inheritance trusts, um, and uh, offshore uh, planning. So today we're gonna cover some recent tax cases around um, offshore CGT and acquisition of a Swiss property, um, information notices, we see quite a few of those, and don't forget they can be appealed. Um, Dane's talking about an interesting case, which was around VAT and when does, when does non-payment uh, become dishonest? Uh, and I will finish off with a, a procedural one, really, and a, and a slight anomaly, strange case, where the revenue tried to get the appeal struck out. So if Dane is going to start us on the, uh, on the first tax case here, thank you. Thanks, Dave. Um, so yeah, this this first case um, uh, involves a husband and wife, UK resident husband and wife couple, Howard and Monique Rawlings, um, and a disposal of a, a Swiss residential property um, that they bought in 2006. Now, they'd taken out a foreign currency mortgage on the property, and when it came to selling it, the way they had calculated it differed from the kind of the rules set out in legislation, which ended up with quite a significant discrepancy in the gain that HMRC had calculated. So um, the way they'd done it, it ended up with a gain of 39,000. When HMRC did it, uh, they'd opened an inquiry within time, they'd looked at it and they'd calculated a gain of 267,000 uh, to be split between the two individuals. The, the, re the reason for the massive difference is purely down to um, the, the volatility or the change in interest rates between those two periods. Um, as the individuals had taken out a, a foreign currency mortgage, they had only accounted for the acquisition costs in 2006 for the deposit that they put down rather than the full acquisition value of the property. Um, and when it came to, to disposing of the property and, and repaying that mortgage, that essentially was, was translated at the exchange rate at the point of disposal, um, which ended up with this, this huge uh, discrepancy. Like I say, it was um, over £200,000 in, in, in the gain alone. Um, and I think that the, the, the taxpayer essentially felt that wasn't fair. Um, they'd, they'd appealed it on that basis, and it was uh, yeah, it, it kind of essentially was um, upheld. The, the principle being there that you have to kind of convert into sterling at each transactional point. So the value of the acquisition um, at the point of acquisition, if there was any enhancement expenditure throughout the period of ownership, you would convert that at the um, at those relevant points whenever the expenditure was incurred. A um, couple of other kind of points just to kind of ha have in the back of our mind there is foreign tax credit relief. So to see if this property was subject to tax in Switzerland um, or wherever the, the gain may have occurred, there is relief available for that, that tax. There's a, a calculation to do there, which kind of certain, restricts it in certain times, but certainly you do get relief for that. Um, and this is kind of a relevant one that we see in quite a lot of our um, disclosures that we make to HMRC. Um, a lot of our clients have received nudge letters for offshore property income and disposals. Um, so this is certainly one that it's important to, to kind of get it right. There, there, there was another interesting, well, I'll say interesting, there was another point within this case where HMRC had initially um, raised the assessments and, and applied the wrong rates of tax. They applied a 10 and 20% CG rates rather than the 18 or 28%, which is uh, applicable to residential properties. So that was a kind of a mistake on HMRC's part, but it was it was picked up during a review and, um, and corrected. 
but just goes to show that there are a, a fair few elements to, to get right when making these disclosures. Thanks, thank, thank, thank you, Dane. Yeah, it was an interesting case. And uh, so we've, we've seen quite a few where um, people have maybe uh, calculated the capital gain um, using the offshore currency rates and then converting the gain into, into sterling. Um, obviously, if the currency has moved up and down, then you may win or lose um, on, the, on, on the correct way of working out. It does have to be the exchange rates at acquisition and at disposal. You don't, you don't do the gain in, in the foreign currency, you do the gain in, in sterling um, conversions throughout. And as, as Dane also mentioned, obviously that applies to any costs in, in between as well, would be uh, exchanged to sterling at the time you incur the cost. And then they come off the calculations. It's um, a, a simple error that some people do make and just need to watch out for. So again, another area we see a lot of is information notices. And there, there are grounds for appeal against information notices. You can't uh, appeal against statutory records. And then there's sometimes arguments over what are statutory records. You can appeal if the request is for old records, if it's more than six years old, and, and they, they can, uh, they, the revenue don't necessarily have a right to obtain those. Um, but also the other argument um, of, of an appeal is whether they're actually reasonably required for the uh, for HMRC as part of their inquiry work. And in this case, it was involving quite a complex argument of transfer of assets abroad or settlements legislation, the revenue want one or the other. Um, that issue is subject to an underlying tax uh, appeal, which is heading to the tribunal itself, and the revenue have already issued, therefore, assessments which are under appeal. But the revenue continued to issue information notices for bank statements for the family, and they were appealed against on the grounds that not reasonably required uh, by HMRC. The, the tribunal um, upheld that appeal and agreed um, to say that those um, bank statements are not reasonably required for this case. Um, at the tribunal hearing, if information should be shared or in support of an appeal, then some of those documents may well form part of the tribunal process instead. Um, so there's, there's you know, two issues there. It doesn't mean to say that the information will never be used or never obtained, but the appropriate manner once assessments have been issued is as part of the appeal process and tribunal. Um, the revenue should be issuing information notices before assessments are issued. Um, uh, one, one has to sometimes question if they've come to a decision to raise an assessment, what more information do they need for that, that assessment? In, in this case, obviously, the, the information is probably held overseas um, and, and whether the revenue should, should require that is decided. Um, no, it's not reasonably required. Um, it is on, well, obviously, it turns out specific facts, as do many of the appeals on information notices turn on the facts of the case. But still, an interesting point to know that um, information notices can be appealed and be successful. Thanks, Dave. Uh, so this next one, um, so another VAT case. We've, we've seen a lot of VAT cases where they're applying the, the, the kids' health principles, whereby HMRC are asserting that entities, uh, all comes down to their due diligence and whether they knew or should have known that there was a VAT fraud being committed in their kind of supply chains. This one's slightly different because it involved um, some associated companies, but ultimately um, it led to HMRC denying uh, the right for the, the main trading entity, Grantham Ceilings, uh, input VAT of 289,000 thereabouts on the supplies made to, to an associated company. Now, uh, the main trading company, um, Grantham Ceilings, they supply building and construction services. And they set up a holding company to ring fence contracts with employees and subcontractors of a, a non-tax related kind of uh, reason. Um, the holding company charged management fee to the trading company to Grantham Ceilings, um, which was a taxable supply for VAT. Grantham Ceilings claimed the VAT, however, the holding company never accounted for this um, and didn't pay the VAT over to, uh, to HMRC. So HMRC essentially said, uh, 
considering that the, the two main principles here, the Kissel principle, uh, whereby the directors of Grantham Ceilings either knew or should have known that the transactions were connected with the fraudulent evasion of VAT. And this one, it's a bit easier for them to kind of say that because um, obviously there's a, a shared ownership between them. So the directors uh, of, of both companies should have um, understood that it was being reported in one and not in the other. The Finney uh, principle is that they'd exercised, Grantham Ceilings had exercised their right to deduct for fraudulent or abusive ends. Um, GC contested this, um, that they, they didn't act deliberately and that ultimately the reason for this was um, due to commercial issues, um, commercial pressures, some cash flow problems that they'd faced um, and it was nothing to do with deliberate behaviour. Now, the, I suppose the key point to take away from this, um, sorry, sorry, the, the decision to, de yeah, to deny the input for VAT was upheld. Um, one, one of the kind of the phrases that was mentioned quite a lot in the decision is um, having a kind of a time to pay arrangement with HMRC or a payment plan in place. The key, the kind of key thing to take away here is that had the company spoken to HMRC, had they had that open dialogue early on about the issues they were facing um, and payment plans could have been negotiated or, or arranged, that would have gone quite a way for them showing that they weren't acting deliberately. Um, but ultimately, the fact that they had failed to even contact HMRC when it was clear that one entity was claiming it and the other wasn't, um, they had the, they had plenty of opportunity to do that and they, and they never did. And that ultimately um, led to, to HMRC denying that input VAT on, uh, on Grantham ceilings. But yeah, key point to take away is we, we deal with payment plans all of the time, but it's it's really, it's so much easier to, to have that open dialogue early with HMRC and, and obviously prevent some of these decisions being made. Yep. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Good, good point. Um, certainly, if you if you are facing debt problems with HMRC, it's best to uh, to to approach them before due dates, um, if possible, and agree payment plans um, can can avoid further problems down down the road. We'll come to our final case now, which is also another VAT case and a similar sort of scenario, in fact, where there'd been um, a loss of VAT, fraudulent evasion of VAT within uh, within the uh, supply chain. Um, the particular appellant um, at, 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 at was arguing against um, the imposition against against them from from HMRC and, and so, yeah, arguing that they didn't know um, that the fraud had happened within the chain and um, that they had taken sufficient due diligence, um, etc. Um, the revenue had um, argued at the first tier that the case should be struck out. Um, and there shouldn't be a, a, an appeal. The, the first tier disagreed with that and said, no, the appeal should should continue. The revenue were arguing to, basically to say that there, there was no defence, there was no grounds for appeal, and therefore the, the appeal should just be struck out and never heard. The, uh, the revenue appealed, so in this case, the revenue were the appellant, they appealed against the first tier decision to say that um, the uh, appeal should be struck out. The upper tribunal, um, uh, agreed with with HMRC and said that the case uh, the appeal should be struck out. But strangely, they've actually still uh, referred it back to the first tier to reconsider the, the, the case, but with a, a different uh, tribunal, a different judge. So although the decision has been uh, set aside, um, it's not been dis dismissed completely. It has just been passed back to the first tier to, to look at again. Um, but probably one of, the, one, of the, one of the reasons around that may be because the appellant has um, knocked out uh, or admitted um, a number of their points of appeal no longer apply and the issue rests purely on the knowledge of, of the trader. And as Dane mentioned in the um, earlier case, um, knowledge um, of, of fraud is an important um, defence um, in, in, or, or acquisition of um, accusation by HMRC to what knowledge did, did they have of the fraud within the uh, chain. Hence, due diligence is extremely important um, in, in cases with, with traders, and something to watch out for. And if you do fall foul of many of these points, you do need to take uh, professional advice. Obviously, it can become uh, quite quite serious. So we've, we've seen um, today um, the revenue don't always get it right. They do win in some cases. Um, uh, and, and, and lose others. We've seen information 
um, powers uh, appeal um, go against the revenue. Um, we, we've seen just, just now on, on the strikeout go against the revenue um, at the first tier. Um, so do, do keep an eye on, on issues uh, and, and take uh, specialist advice where you've got formal determinations, assessments, notices, um, in case there are rights to appeal and, and chances to take it further. If, if you want um, help and advice, do contact us at Chetra Tax Advisors. Details are on the, on the slides. Uh, myself and Dane or contact our um, office in London. So thank you very much for joining us um, again uh, today. We will be back um, next month with another um, investigations webinar. Do join our colleague um, Jamal in, in a couple of weeks for the, his, his tax advisory tax planning webinar updates as well. Do make sure you signed up. Um, you can watch this, this recording um, in your own time or you may be watching the recording now. Um, yeah, there are other recordings available on our channel. Thank you for watching. Thank you for joining. Bye. Thank you. Cheers. Bye.